Friday live stream. Apologies again for last week that cut off. For those of you who watch the recording, those are going to be either on the live section or on the regular video section of YouTube. But thank you for joining me live. I'm excited to talk about this topic because if you haven't noticed, going to the moon is one of my favorite topics. And along those lines, I wanted to congratulate JAXA, but also express my sympathy to, to JAXA, who um, just attempted a soft lunar landing. It seems like they succeeded in landing their slim mission to the surface of the moon, but they're having issues with their batteries. And as of this recording, I don't know whether or not they have an update as to how they're going to fix their power situation. It might be that it's a very temporary mission, but I wish them success. Of course, my heart goes out to Astrobotic this week that burned up its lunar lander in the Earth's atmosphere after it failed to make that lunar landing. And I have all fingers crossed for uh, Intuitive Machines and Firefly and whoever else decides to launch this year. Landing on the moon is tough. I actually just started reading an old book that many of you are probably familiar with, um, The Moon uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. Um, I'm only like six or seven chapters into it, so I'm not quite there yet, but it it it's one of these dreams that we've had for so long, returning humans to the moon, or, or I shouldn't say return, going, sending humans to the moon and living there and staying there permanently. And this is relevant because that's what I believe we should be doing, is bringing humans there to stay there. That's what the Artemis program is all about. It is not but Apollo was meant to show that the United States could beat the Soviet Union to the moon. And it was a geopolitical competition. And yes, it was course to explore and to make sure that we uh, could prove the technology and the science to send humans to the moon and collect lunar samples. And, um, you know, we set up some instrumentation that's still operational on the surface of the moon. We went there with the rover a few times, a couple times, I think. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, Jackson says. So thank you for those in the comments. Hi, Randy. Hi, Russ. Um, so I am really, really pleased that Apollo was so successful as it was because Apollo, even though I wasn't alive then, inspired me as a kid to pursue science, to pursue um, you know, space science, astrophysics, and planetary science in particular. And my background is in lunar regolith. That's the dust and dirt on the surface of the moon. So that is the uh, topic that I worked on with my PhD research. However, I do not want a repeat of Apollo because Apollo went a few times for a few days at a time, and then we never went back for over 50 years now. Artemis is meant to be different. And if you rewind the clock back to something called the Constellation Program, that was under George W. Bush, not George H. W. Bush, he had a different program returning to the moon, but George W. Bush had the Constellation Program to return humans to the moon in a very Apollo-like fashion. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today, because this concept has been resurrected by former NASA Administrator Michael Griffin. He gave testimony on Wednesday, January 17th, which happened to be my birthday, so I was actually watching... Uh, I'm a, I'm a space geek. What can I say? A wonky subject on my birthday. And he apparently has not yet grown past this idea. He has several, um, you know, doc, he, he has several degrees. And one of his theses was on this very concept of, of a kind of a constellation architecture. And if you don't remember constellation, honestly, I don't know if I remember the details right now either, <laughs> but it had to do with a large rocket and a lunar lander that are built by the government, built by NASA, owned by NASA. So very Apollo-like, um, straightforward means of getting astronauts to the surface of the moon and back uh, with multiple stages and uh, uh, very much Apollo. It's very, very much Apollo times, you know, take two. Um, um, but that ended up being cost prohibitive. And not only that, like it was unrealistic. They were having problems with the, uh, the Ares rocket. Um, Ares did do one successful test launch without people on board. That was the Ares 1X. I can't remember what year that is. Someone remind me what year that was. But um, I was watching that from <laughs> from Marshall Space Flight Center, actually, um, from the from the um, the screen, not in person, uh, obviously because it was in Florida. But um, I was there at Marshall as an intern, working and um, being surrounded by the environment of people who are so excited about the Constellation program. And I myself, as a NASA intern, as a student, was so excited about the Constellation program. So excited about returning humans to the moon until I later realized just how unsustainable it is. Because when you have a program that expensive, 
um, it, it's just, you don't have a good geopolitical reason to go back. Like we had the, the space race feeding the Soviet Union to the moon. And once we accomplished that, there was not that political will to keep funding that for very much longer, which is why we had some cancellations of those later uh, Apollo missions that were on, you know, they, they had, I forget how many they'd scheduled out into Apollo 15 or 16. I forget someone, someone else tell me, um, but they had several missions that were scheduled out that they canceled because there was no geopolitical reason to spend that kind of money to do that. Um, and so when you're thinking about the Constellation program, it did not have the sustainability in terms of the funding. It didn't even have the initial funding, honestly. Um, so George W. Bush administration, they did not provide, it's not the administration, it's the Congress. The Congress did not provide the funding to NASA to um, accomplish an extremely expensive human spaceflight program to the moon. And the reason why I'm talking about this history is because this was brought up as an alternative to the Artemis program. Um, you can go into the, the notes for this recording and you can see the link to the House uh, the House hearing. Uh, they had uh, t several uh, panelists, um, you know, some representative from NASA, representative from the Office of the Inspector General. Um, they had Mike Griffin there. Don't know why they had him there, but they did. Um, I would have preferred someone a little bit more recent, but you know, they, they had him to provide we should restart it, it being keep it on track because the title of the hearing was something about keeping Artemis on track. I have it opened in a tab here. The returning to the moon, keeping Artemis on track was the actual name of the hearing. And in Mike Griffin's uh, written and oral testimony, he said, we should not be keeping it on track. He used the words a do-over. And so, and so that piqued my interest. I'm like, okay, if you don't think Artemis is on track and I, I kind of agree with you for pose, what is this do-over? And to my disappointment, and I had been researching for this live stream. I had been looking for someone who supports him. I've been looking for any kind of viewpoint that says this is a good idea. I haven't found it. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're out there. Maybe you support Mike Griffin in this, this uh, architecture that he is proposing. Um, if so, write in the chats or write in the comments because I cannot find anybody. And I have a fairly wide space circle. I can't find anyone who thinks this is a good idea other than Mike Griffin. So <laughs> I am going to go through this. Um, Question from Ross, do you think Mike Griffin wants to resurrect Apollo-style mission architecture for Artemis because he was a key player in the Constellation program and wants to find, uh, wants to finish what he tried to start? Yes. Yes, Ross, that is exactly what I think. Um, so he's attached to this idea. You know, we fall in love with these ideas. I remember I met Buzz Aldrin on several occasions, and he is passionate about this Aldrin cycler. Look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's a means of transporting people and cargo to the, to Mars um, in a in a secular clear, whatever that word is, in a, in a rotating fashion. Um, so people get attached to these ideas when we think that they're our babies, right? But the problem is when we don't evolve with the times. And that's what happened with this uh, hearing that he gave this testimony. Um, he really kept his spoken testimony very short. It's really in the written testimony that you get the details. Um, you can see a graphic of the con-ups of his architecture. And, you know... If NASA did have an endless budget, sure, why not? <laughs> why not? But NASA does not have an endless budget. And one of the major things that he has a problem with is the uh, involvement of the commercial space sector. But I'm going to go into that later. I want to first talk about his spoken testimony because he had a real emphasis on China, which is not surprising because pretty much all NASA representatives for the past, I don't know, five years, maybe longer, 10 years, I'm thinking back. Um, have been talking about a uh, competition with China. And it hasn't always been a lunar competition. It's been a general space competition. Some people use the term space race. I don't because I don't believe that you, we as the United States are racing. Um, we're certainly not in any urgency here. Uh, but there are, have been people who have been trying to frame this as a space race with China to get humans on the moon. Or to We, we won that race, by the way. We run that in 1969. So it's really not a race to win because we already won it. Um, we'd be in the United States. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> so um, when you're thinking about a competition with China and... Um, Mike Griffin, after he served as NASA administrator, also served as an important role in the Department of Defense. So he comes at it from two different viewpoints. And in fact, he has a quote in his written testimony. Um, don't know if I can find it at the moment. Uh, we cannot, quote, we cannot separate civil space exploration from national security space, end quote. And I actually agree with him here. I wish I didn't, but 
um, when I was a student, I was absolutely full on civil space and I did not want to do anything in defense space, military space. And then as I've gone in my career, I see how intertwined they are. They are truly connected. And of course, they're connected in a place like China where there is no separation. But here in the United States, NASA was formed as a civil space agency but it was still intertwined with military and it still is. And I don't know if we can ever truly separate that. Uh, the Space Force's budget is larger than NASA's budget now. It, it is just, it's one of those things where both go together because you have what the civil space agency and the commercial space companies want to do, but then you have adversaries who try to block or disrupt that or in other way be, um, you know, players that are not reliable or trustworthy. And therefore you have to have military involvement to back up what these civil and commercial players are trying to do. And I wish it wasn't true, but I actually do agree with him there. Where I disagree with him is that we need to be so very focused on what China is doing. If you watched my live stream last week, or you can go back and watch the recording, I talked about how China is actually using a more direct method of getting humans back to, to the moon, they actually are focused on their their lunar base, and they're not taking the sidetrack of doing a lunar space station like we are with Gateway. And I think that's a better architecture. So I actually agree with Mike Griffin. And what caught my interest was that you know we need to do things differently with with Artemis architecture. So I agree with him there. Where we disagree is how, because I think that it should be more straightforward with um, the way that we do things. But I disagree with his alternate solution. One thing that he brought up that I did not know when I did my live stream last week is another reason why I don't like Gateway now. <laughs> he brought this up again in his written testimony, uh, quote, immediate return to the Gateway from the lunar surface is possible only on a 6.5 day centers. If a lunar crew encounters a problem on the surface that mandates a return that comprehensive that the comparative safety of the gateway, then depending on upon where the problem occurs, a multi-day wait might be required. So someone who knows the architecture better than me can tell me whether Mike Griffin is correct here. If he's correct, and there's only 6.5 day increments that astronauts can return to the, the gateway, then that is a problem. And I completely agree. It's another reason why I don't like gateway then. I wish I'd known about that last week when I was doing the way to evacuate astronauts off the surface of the moon. According to him, I don't I don't know Apollo uh, architecture well enough to know if he's correct. The conops I've mentioned, it requires two SLS Block II heavy lift launches carrying a Centaur III upper stage, an Orion command and service module, and two stage storable propellant lunar lander yet to be designed. Do you have any? Uh, do you see any problems with that? Any red flags pop up? I, I, for me, I think three red flags pop up immediately there. One being. Two SLS launchers. SLS launch. Um, SLS has been exceedingly so, exceedingly expensive. Um, it's it's politically popular, so it's not going to be canceled anytime soon. But how many SLS launches do you anticipate? And this is not just SLS launches that we have now. Block two is another another uh, level. So how many SLS Block two launches do you think we can have per per um, mission? Uh, I'm not seeing a means or a capability of producing more SLS launchers of any type um, in an affordable and quick manner to be able to actually do this. One of the problems I have with Artemis as it currently exists is it's a lot slower than Apollo. Apollo, like they were, they were in a rush. Like I totally believe the space race wording for Apollo. They had urgency. We do not have urgency in Artemis. We we are slow. And maybe that slowness is required for our current understanding of astronaut safety, or maybe that slowness is required for our current budget that Congress has given NASA um, and refuses to budge on. Or maybe that slowness has to do with the fact that we want it to be sustainable. I started out this talk mentioning, I truly believe that this should be sustainable. But regardless, I don't see that we're going to be able to ramp up production with the current capability and funding to have two SLS Block II heavy lift launches per mission. Other red flag here is a lunar lander yet to be designed. <laughs> so if you think back to Constellation, there was the Antares lander, which I thought was just super cool, but it never became existent because it was deemed as too expensive. And it's just uh, it's just another example of how Mike Griffin doesn't want commercial companies involved. They, he wants NASA to build a lunar lander. So SLS is a NASA rocket. It is, of course, built by Boeing, um, Orion, Lockheed Martin. Do I have that right? I'm pretty sure that's right, right? Boeing is the rocket, Lockheed Martin is the capsule. I, I get that confused for some reason. Um, but 
uh, the lunar landers are selected by NASA to be private companies that are designing their own lunar landers, and NASA is buying seats upon them. So SLS was the first, I'm sorry, wow. Um, SpaceX was the first with its Starship, and uh, Blue Origin was the second with its Blue Moon. And those are currently in development. And they are not, you know, finished, but they are a good ways past the initial design stage. They have hardware, um, you know, SLS. I'm sorry, why do I keep saying SLS? Uh, Starship is in the process of proving itself to be space worthy in terms of getting to orbit. I truly believe that Starship will get to orbit this year and it'll probably get to orbit multiple times this year. That's my prediction. I don't know where, I don't know how far it needs to go from Starship in orbit to Starship a, a human landing system variant, but it's it's not starting from scratch, whereas Mike Griffin wants us to start from scratch with a lunar lander. So huge red flag there. Um, and also there's no understanding that this is going to be sustainable. In his testimony, his, his oral testimony, he actually does say that he wants it to be sustainable. At the end of the hearing, he made some statement like he's been trying for 30 years to make a uh, return to the moon sustainable and maybe he should retire. And 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 it, it was a joke. He didn't mean that realistically, <laughs> but maybe he should retire. But um, there is nothing about Constellation and there's nothing about this proposed architecture that's sustainable to me. Uh, it does seem to be Apollo time, you know, second Apollo. Um, it's one of those things where four people on the surface of the moon for a week in any location. Okay, a week, that's a good start. And Artemis is no better, honestly. Artemis is, is also very short sorties. But there's nothing in here that talks about sustainability. There's nothing that talks about like a lunar base or anything that is going to be uh, other than completely on the government's shoulders of making lunar infrastructure. He does talk about the fact that he thinks there is, this is in his uh, oral testimony, he talked about he thinks that there is a return on investment for commercial companies to uh, have a, set, a place in lunar infrastructure. So he thinks that there should be lunar infrastructure that is built by commercial companies so that they can have a return on investment in that means. And he does not think that the... Um, the fundamentals of the architecture should be commercially based. In fact, he takes issue with the whole term commercial space. And that's a whole other debate that I'm not going to go into. Maybe if you want, you can write in the comments or in the chat if you want me to go into a whole another debate on another time about the term commercial space. But he is of the opinion that commercial space does not currently exist, where I wonder where he's been for the past, how many years has it been? Uh, 2020 was when SpaceX started taking over from um, where Space Shuttle retired and launching astronauts to the International Space Station. So the United States has been reliant on commercial companies to launch humans. In fact, we had the excellent Artem, uh, yeah, Axiom Space, Axiom 3 mission launch the ISS yesterday. Where has Mike Griffin been? <laughs> like, how has he not realized that uh, we have commercial companies that are taking cargo to and from the ISS. We have commercial companies, or at least one company taking crew to the ISS and other companies that are doing suborbital human spaceflight. So he says that he does not think that there is a role. I actually have a quote somewhere in my notes here. The fundamental flaw in the Artemis acquisition approach is the assumption that the US government can and should leverage so-called commercial space for national purposes, and that this paradigm is applicable to human spaceflight. Where have you been, Mike Griffin? <laughs> This has been going on. This is not new. And so to ignore the advances that we've had in commercial space light and pr public private partnerships to go back in time to Constellation before those even before SpaceX got off its, its feet and, uh, you know, before all these other advances in commercial human space flight, like where, why, why would you go backwards in time and make it less sustainable? Because when you have commercial company involvement, you have a profit motive and you have many more customers because the U.S. government has only so the U.S. government is restricted, whereas private companies aren't necessarily as restricted. So you have, for example, that Axiom 3 flight I just mentioned had customers that were European governments and European governments are going to be part of the Artemis program in terms of the partnerships. But here you have an actual customer base that is commercial, uh, I'm sorry, European governments and uh, commercially focused. Um, you know, previous art, uh, Axiom flights, just as an example, had pri private individuals who were paying their own way. And there are other means, you know, other companies out there that are willing to pay. The idea is that we can start out with it being heavily government focused, you know, government as an anchor tenant. And then as it becomes more mature, 
then these private companies are going to be able to sell to other players, other players being, yes, foreign governments and other players being those uh, that can afford it, like, let's just say a pharmaceutical company in terms of like space stations, but um, eventually we'll be able to branch out. So the term commercial space is problematic. I agree with that, but I don't think it's something to be thrown out or ignored or, you know, turn the clock back. And so um, when I think about the idea of doing a constellation again, I think of all the reasons why constellation was canceled. And I was one that as a student, I was very upset that constellation was canceled, but we don't need to go back in time. In fact, we need to take what we have with Artemis and just simply make it better. And by make it better, I don't necessarily mean like now, like in the short term, because SLS and Orion are hugely uh, popular. <laughs> um, they're not going anywhere at this time, but I do believe they're going to be phased out eventually as Starship comes online, as Vulcan and New Glenn and any other launchers can prove themselves. I do believe that we're going to have better architecture. I don't believe, in fact, there's nothing about Gateway that fundamentally requires it to be in the middle of this process of Artemis architecture. It's just simply a waypoint that is added to justify Gateway's existence and to justify the use of Orion. Whereas if, as we continue to go through Artemis and build up Artemis infrastructure, build up any kind of infrastructure in cislunar space, in lunar orbit, on the surface of the moon, we're going to do things better. At least that's my hope. I'm an optimist, so maybe maybe I'll be proven wrong. It's funny because I'm a skeptic in my job as a, as a consultant and an analyst, but I am an optimist when it comes to the future of human spaceflight because I do believe we're on a good track. I do believe that we're not on the best track or a perfect track or even a fully sustainable track, but I do believe that current Artemis architecture is better than the alternative proposed by Mike Griffin. If you find this very helpful, you can go ahead and subscribe to Astrolytical's newsletter at astrolytical.com slash subscribe. And if you are a company hoping to do business in space or wanting to expand in space, reach out to Astrolytical because that's what we do. We break down the space industry for people who are looking to expand into space. We Individuals, I'm a space career coach, but also businesses, government entities, nonprofits. Um, another thing I want to talk about with that hearing and the question about the, the hearing was even called because Artemis was announced that it was going to be delayed. And if you watch my recording, December 29th, I believe it was, where I predicted that Artemis 2 and 3, well, actually I said Artemis 2, but Artemis 2 was going to be delayed and then naturally Artemis 3 is delayed. This is not a surprise. It is not a surprise that we have announcements that NASA is adjusting its timeline to what is more realistic. Now, I do not think that the current timeline is all that realistic either. Um, I'm thinking that there's still going to be slippage with both Artemis 2 and 3. And that is why that hearing was called to better understand why these de delays are being, um, you know, being announced now, what's a realistic time frame, um, what NASA needs to do, what commercial partners need to do, what international partners need to do, like all of these things flow together. Um, and I'm not bothered by the fact that there are delays because I feel like it's finally going to happen. It's going to happen before 2030. Um, some kind of humans uh, touching surface on the on the moon is going to happen by 2030. Is my you know my pessimistic prediction, um, let alone my optimistic prediction. My optimistic prediction is 2027. Well, I don't think that's happening. 2028 maybe. Um, but that's exciting to me, and I don't really care whether it's 2027 or 2030. It's exciting that it's happening within my time frame, within my lifetime. And maybe you feel the same way. If this is a topic that excites you, please let me know what else you want to know. This is generally a q and A. I I want to know whether questions you have. We have had some questions come in that I'm just not that much of an expert in, such as space insurance. And so I'm going to have to do some background research to really learn a bit more about the insurance market in the space industry. But if you have any questions, please write them in the comments or send me a DM on, connect with me on social media. Happy to talk to you. And I'd be over the moon if you subscribed because I have a goal of this year getting a thousand subscribers subscribers on YouTube. It's free for you to subscribe and it means a lot to me and I appreciate it. Leave your questions in the comments or in the chat. I'm, I'm looking to see. I know we have people watching live, so I see you. I appreciate you. Um, so please do keep in mind that um, this is something we're learning together and I'm going to do the best I can to break things down for you. Reach out to me. Have a wonderful day.